Uh, we have uh, Stefan Wolf from Harvard University. Uh, he's got two very interesting papers uh, that are relevant to the work he's presenting uh, that are on BioArchive, uh, which we'll post in the chat. And his talk is titled Motor Skill Learning and Execution in a Distributed Brain Network. All right, can you hear me? Is it good? Yeah? Yep, yeah, it's good. Okay, perfect. Well, <clears throat> hello everyone. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction, Adam, and uh, great to be here at this amazing conference. And um, I'm going to talk about my postdoctoral work, which deals with learning and executing complex motor skills. And a perfect example for these skills is beach volleyball. Yeah, And um, here you see a friend of mine uh, performing a beach volleyball surf, and he's such an expert that he can repeat this complex motor sequence over and over again in a very stereotyped and precise manner. But to get to this point, he actually had to go through a long period of trial and error learning in <clears throat> which he was able to, uh, to adapt and concatenate individual motor elements, like throwing up the ball, hitting the ball and jumping and so on, into a de novo feed forward motor sequence yeah, with very rich kinematics. And we are interested in the neural circuits which underlie both the learning and the execution of such complex skills. In the lab, however, we can't really study beach volleyball players, but instead we study rats. And it turns out rats are actually horribly bad at playing beach volleyball. And therefore we developed a different task for these rats. And James has introduced this task already. Yeah, but let me explain again what is actually happening here. So in this task, our rats have to press a lever two times with a specific time interval in between the presses. And the more precisely they do this, the more reward they get. Yeah. <clears throat> what happens now during uh, over a long period of trial and error learning is that these animals do not only learn to press the lever two times, but they also develop a de novo feed forward motor sequence, which happens to fill this time gap in between the presses. And they do this by again, adapting and concatenating individual motor elements into the sequence. And um, <clears throat> importantly, the more precisely and the more, in a, the, the more stereotyped this sequence becomes, the more reward the animals actually get. So you're gonna see an, an, ex, um, an example now, and this rat here is gonna rear up, press the lever once, then it's gonna perform some stereotype movements with its forelimbs, press the lever again, and then go down to get the reward. So you're gonna see the whole thing two times and really pay attention how stereotyped this behavior actually is. So the animal goes up, that's the first press. Now you see the stereotype movements, second press and down to get the reward. So same thing again, first press, stereotype movements, second press and reward. Of course, this is not beach volleyball, yeah, but I hope that you can appreciate that this task actually resembles human motor skill learning in many important aspects. We can look at the behavior now a bit more into de in detail by looking at this interpress interval itself, which is a great proxy for the performance and for the precision of the animal. Yeah, here I'm going to, I'm going to show you such um, probability density plots which show the development of the IPI over the period, uh, over the course of learning. And you can see here, I marked 700 milliseconds. That is the target on which these animals are trained. And you can appreciate that in the beginning, these animals are pretty bad and the IPI is very variable into low, but then in the end, they really are precisely on point just around 700 milliseconds. And we can study now uh, the neural circuits which both un underlie the learning and the execution period in this behavior. In a classical model, we would assume that motor cortex really underlies the control of these learned behaviors and that learning happens by, via interactions between motor cortex, the basal ganglia and the thalamus, and then the memories for these behaviors are stored both in motor cortex and in the corticosteroidal projections. So we tested how well this, uh, this model actually applies to our behavior. And we did this by lesioning motor cortex and not surprisingly, we found that this, that motor cortex is indeed necessary to learn these sequences. But to our big surprise, we found that it's not necessary to actually execute them once they have been learned. Yeah, this suggests that motor cortex does not play the role of a controller here, that the memories are not stored in motor cortex, but instead that motor cortex rather plays the role of a tutor guiding and instructing subcortical circuits to learn these sequences and once, once they have been learned, these subcortical circuits can drive the generation and execution of these sequences. 
And the prime candidate in the subcortical circuitry to assume control, uh, a control function in this process are the basal ganglia. Yeah, the basal ganglia project to brainstem and midbrain motor circuits and could thereby drive directly the execution of these, uh, of these behaviors. And they receive massive input from motor cortex and could thereby be tutored directly during the learning phase. And this is supported by further experiments I've done in which I've specifically um, silenced the projection from motor cortex to the dorsal lateral striatum, which is the input nucleus of the basal ganglia, which receives motor cortical input. If I silence this projection, then animals can't learn, just like after motor cortex lesions. And also, if I lesion the DLS itself, these animals can't learn the task. So this is all consistent with this idea that during learning, motor cortex tutors the basal ganglia, and then the basal ganglia take control. But how can they take control? This is a bit surprising because usually the basal ganglia are usually seen a little bit like uh, a jukebox. Yeah, a jukebox where you can select a song and then you change the volume of the song if you would like to. So what I mean by that is that two of the dominant theories about basal ganglia function are that they are involved in action selection or in vigor modulation. Yeah, and um, so both of these different possibilities, you're just selecting what you do or modulating how fast you do that or with, with what amplitude, that works well for relatively simple behaviors just like saccades or ballistic arm movements. But that might not work so well if you actually try to, to control more complex behaviors like the one we train with very rich kinematics. Yeah, in this case, the basal ganglia might have to take more of a really control function. And while these three different possibilities look very different from each other, if you view them from the general point of view of um, the framework of reinforcement learning, you can imagine that these are just three different variants of the same function. Yeah, reinforcement learning suggests that what the basal ganglia actually do is mapping specific behavioral or environmental states to specific rewarding actions. Yeah, and you could now imagine that depending on the behavior you want to learn, this, this state action mapping can be increasingly complex yeah, and with increasing complexity, uh, complexity both in the states and in the actions. So, yeah, and then you could have like these three functions on the left being essentially just more increasingly complex variants of state action mapping. If this is the case, then we would expect that the basal ganglia have information both about the state and about the action which is performed, and that this is continuous to actually be able to control these complex uh, motor sequences, and that this activity is actually necessary for the control. We started testing that by implanting tetrodes in the DLS in expert animals, and we recorded the activity of individual neurons, and we used these great machine learning uh, methods which are available now to track the body parts of the animals while they're performing the task. So here you see some example trials and you see and hear the activity of one neuron in the DLS. And what you can see is that this, the firing of this neuron is very sparse, but it's very time locked just to the first lever press in the sequence. And we find many neurons with similarly sparse and time locked activity, but they're active at different times during the sequence. And in fact, if we look at all of the cells we record from, we find that they really tile the whole, mot uh, the whole motor sequence. Yeah, we see continuous activity throughout the sequence, and this is in stark contrast to the activity we see in the dorsal medial striatum, which is just next to the DLS and receives many prefrontal input. Here we hardly see any um, task-related activity. Yeah. <clears throat> so that means, yes, we have continuous activity in the DLS, which is, is consistent with this control idea, but what is really represented in this activity? We performed an encoding analysis first to ask whether both state and action related variables like the position or the velocity of the forelimbs are actually represented in the activity in the DLS. And indeed, we find a representation of both, which is much stronger than the one we find in the dorsal media striatum. And importantly, this, uh, this uh, representation is still there if we lesion motor cortex. Yeah, so that means this is independent of motor cortex, meaning these, this could really contribute to the motor cortex independent execution of these sequences. But is this enough information to generate the behavior? We performed a decoding analysis also to see if we could predict the behavior just from DLS activity. And here are 150 trials of DLS movements, just the forelimb velocity. And indeed, we can predict this very well. 
Yeah, so the decoding performance is quite high here. And that meaning there is enough information in the DLS activity to actually generate this behavior. But is this activity also used? Yeah, do we need the DLS to actually perform these sequences? I lesion the DLS in trained animals. And here you see the interpress interval just before the lesion and early on in training. And after the DLS lesion, you see the performance is strongly disrupted and the interpress interval essentially looks like early in training. So that means the DLS is necessary, but what does it actually do? Yeah, how does it influence the behavior? Does it, is it necessary to really control the generation or is it just modulating the behavior? To look at this, we looked in more detail at the actual behavior the animal performs. We tracked the forelimbs. Yeah, and here you see an example of uh, the two forelimb trajectories during the task. And these arrows just indicate the two lever presses. After the lesion, this looks completely different. Yeah, you see, this is not just like a misregulated version of, this of the original trajectory, but the animal has, it shows a completely different behavior. And if we uh, compare this across animals, we find that these animals have very idiosyncratic behavior before the lesion, but afterwards it looks almost the same what they do. Yeah, so this is even more apparent if you just look at the lever press movements themselves. Yeah, they are very idiosyncratic before the lesion, but afterwards they look essentially the same both across animals and across the two lever presses. And this suggested to us that maybe without the DLS, the animals re are reverting back to some behavior they use innately before they ever learn the sequence. So we looked at lever presses early in learning, and indeed we find they also look the same. Yeah, so what that means to us is that maybe brainstem or midbrain motor controllers are able to generate these relatively simple lever press movements. But then during learning, state action mapping occurs, which allows the animal to learn idiosyncratic, more complex motor sequences by adapting and concatenating such simple motor elements. Yeah, and then we lesion the DLS and this state action mapping is gone and the animals re revert back to these simple movements. But if this is all true, then there's one important open question. And that is if the state action mapping is learned with the help of motor cortex during the learning phase, but motor cortex is not necessary to actually perform the learned sequences. Yeah, where's the state information coming from then? One possibility is that this is actually coming from the other major input to the striatum from the thalamus. Uh, and to test this, I uh, specifically silence thalamic inputs to the DLS to see how this affects the behavior. And indeed, if I do this, you see here, this is the performance before. Afterwards, this performance is completely disrupted. And importantly, these animals also never recover. They cannot relearn the task without the thalamic input. If you look in more detail at the behavior, we find that again, this is the complex behavior before, this, uh, before the silencing, but afterwards this looks completely different and the animals perform a completely different behavior than before. And this should look familiar to you because that is actually the same thing the animals performed after DLS lesions. Yeah, so that really suggests that you need the DLS and you need this thalamic input to the DLS to perform the correct movements. And without this, you fall back to these simple movements, which are probably generated by the brainstem. To sum this up, yeah, our, we really believe that the basal ganglia are really at the center of this distributed motor network. And what happens is that during learning, motor cortex allows to learn a state action mapping <clears throat> which then uh, in the DLS and tutoring the DLS, possibly also by gating plasticity at thalamic inputs to the DLS. And we have some experimental evidence that plasticity occurs here also. And then once this has taken place, then the motor cortical input is not necessary anymore. And <clears throat> instead the, the basal ganglia together with the thalamus and the other subcortical circuitry are actually able to generate these complex learned behaviors. So that means if the behavior requires it and if the behavior is so complex that you really need a subcortical controller, then the, ba the basal ganglia can, uh, can uh, assume a function which goes beyond just being a jukebox yeah, and rather resembling something like a DJ who can start a song, can change the volume of the song, but who can also make his own remixes. <laughs>
And with this, um, I would like to close and thank uh, my supervisor, Ben Silvetsky and uh, Ashesh Davade, with whom I did a lot of this work and the other people who are involved. And I just want to say as a last thing, if you like this work and you would like to work on this, or if you want to become really good at playing beach volleyball, you should uh, join my lab from March on the next year at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Stefan. That was really a great talk. That was uh, fantastic work. It's just so comprehensive. Um, we have time for one quick question. Um, I'm going to pull it from the Q&A. Sorry to the people who've been posting in the chat. Um, if the motor cortex is not the controller of movement and, and the basal ganglia is instead, what do you think is the purpose of the latent dynamics seen in its activity during stereotype movements? And then as a follow-up, uh, it was asked, should brain computer interfaces be decoding from DLS rather than motor cortex? Well, I mean, I guess it depends somewhat on the behavior, what motor cortex is actually doing, right? So, I mean, um, uh, this in this behavior where we have a really stereotyped movement sequence, um, the basal ganglia can play an important role, but um, <clears throat> Does, that doesn't mean if like if it's not like such a stereotyped behavior that the motor cortex doesn't control this right so and especially like behaviors which are um which require more dexterous movements and so on the the motor cortex plays an essential role so for for the base for the brain machine interfaces i think looking into motor cortex makes a lot of sense for certain behaviors for sure and um uh, during during this behavior, also what we would see in motor cortex, um, these dynamics, they they, um, they can be there, for example, to allow for flexibility if if the animal actually has to change the behavior. That motor cortex is there and available to actually um, mediate such changes. Great. So that's all we have time for. Um, thank you again to the panelists. This was really fantastic. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of Neuromatch and see you in other sessions. Thank you. Ciao.